Backpacker Ben, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thank you, mate. Yep, good to be here. My first ever podcast. Brilliant. We're honoured, mate. Appreciate yep. you coming on. You said you had a funny story about why uh, why you chose us for your first podcast, mate. Well, I've seen your messages, and um, obviously you guys are from Plymouth, like me, so it's a ten minute drive. And I'll be honest, I've never done a podcast. I find them quite hard to do. I feel like it's pressure. I need to impress you, you know. So the pressure's on. But um, I was drunk in Croatia two weeks ago. Just finished my Africa trip. And um, I was tipsy, seen your message. I was like, yeah, why not? Let's do it. <laughs> I woke up the next day like, oh, no, what have I done? <laughs> and this morning I woke up, I was like, oh, no, I hope they cancel. But um, <laughs> nah, it's sound. I've seen your videos. It's pretty chill. So here we go. Yeah, you'll be fine, mate. But yeah, that's that's a tactic. Just get people when they're drunk. Get them on. That's Happy. it, yeah. That's it. Just late, late night messages now on a Friday or Saturday yeah. night is our tactic. Yeah. Yep, literally do that. Perfect. Well, good to have you though, mate. It's exciting for me because I've been watching your content for a while. Um, and before you, there's there's some some other YouTubers in that space that you knock around with that I've been watching for ages as well. So I, I genuinely find your content really interesting. And it was funny because when I was watching your content, um, I was like, this guy's got certainly a familiar voice. Jana. Yeah, but a familiar face as well. And of course, when you're watching YouTube, you, you just think, well, he's familiar from YouTube. And then I realized that you used to work in, in a gym locally um for a little while and and i saw you in there ages and years ago so you were obviously holding a barbell then um now you're holding a backpack like how did you go from barbell to backpack what was the transition like how did that happen well a lot of people don't know some do but i used to be a pt for like eight years i may not look at it i'm a right state now but that's what backpacking does to you that's what traveling does to you it just wears you out and there's not much time for gym anymore obviously i do it a lot when i'm home but when I'm traveling for months on end, there's no time for like, you know, eating chicken and rice and protein shakes. But yeah, I was a PT for eight years and um, I, ju I just started to travel. Uh, my first country was, um, I basically took a gap year. So I was working as a PT and one of my friends took a gap year. That was another PT, came back, he had this brown tan. He said, you have to spend eight months in Southeast Asia, mate, you'll love it, you got to do it, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you know what? Now, it does sound like a bit of me. So I saved up for like six months at the gym and I took a year off. I had a um, year off the job and I absolutely loved it. Went to like 15 countries, um, your typical Southeast Asia backpacking route. I had a great time. Met some awesome people, still friends to this day and got hooked, came back, did the same job for another year, saved up. But this time I was like, you know what? Um, I want to do a bigger trip and film it. So basically... On that first trip, I was doing like, remember when Snapchat was a thing? Mm -hmm. It still is, obviously, but I don't use it anymore. Um, I used to make funny videos on Snapchat for my friends, but I would always show like the reality of traveling. Like a lot of Instagram, YouTube's fake, isn't it? Like they just show like the glamour, the saturated, you know, luxury lifestyle. I don't do that. I show like the brutal, long journeys and like the reality of a lot of people. And my mates loved it. They found it super funny. So I thought, you know what, let's stick on YouTube, see what happens. And that's it, really. Um, after that long year, YouTube, filming it and stuff, I came back and I was like, okay, let's crack on. Let's swap from barbell to backpack. Hey, guys, just letting you know that we recently launched our new Everyday Black Belt membership on Patreon. This gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them. You also get exclusive content as well as early ad-free access to all of our episodes. So if you love what we do, don't spend 10 years getting a black belt. For the price of a coffee a month, get one now. It helps us, it supports the channel and it helps us bring you better guests. So it wasn't initially like a, a strategic, well-planned out thing that you were going to try and sort of travel and, and be a YouTuber. It was literally just documenting your own journey, sharing it with mates and through Snapchat and then obviously put a video on YouTube. And, and how did the first couple of videos do? Nothing. I, I didn't get a uh, penny. I didn't get any views for like two and a half years. Really? Okay. Yeah. Wow. So I did a lot of videos in Southeast Asia. Just like, I, you have no idea what you're doing, right? When you first start, um, you just pick up a camera and give it a go. I was filming on an iPhone. None of these videos are online anymore. Um, and then I went to India. That's where a lot of YouTubers were going at the time. And because I seen India as like, that's a country I can really be myself because it's all out chaos there, right? And there's a lot of long journeys and, you know, there's a lot of like, it's just chaos there. I recommend you guys check it out. 
like you'll have a crazy time. Um, that's when I started to take it a little bit seriously. Did like six months in India, absolutely ruined me, like destroyed me. But that's how I got monetized because it's quite easy to get views in India because especially three years ago when it was um, YouTube was less popular than what it is now, um, it's easier to get you know views and stuff. Now it's a lot harder. But yeah, I went to India, got monetized, but then I came back, COVID happened. So I had a whole year of zero uploads, an entire year. And that's when um, I had a normal job, worked in an office or something, I uh, worked in another gym. And then that's when I went to, that's when I was like, you know what, uh, let's give it another go. And then I went to Africa and spent like seven months in Africa. And that's when it kickstarted again. Mm -hmm. So that's when I was like, okay, cool. Now I can like pursue it. I can see it as like a job potentially. So that was my, yeah. That's how it properly started when COVID. Do you remember when we went to second lockdown? Yeah. That's when I was like, I'm not coming back to this. That's yeah. when I stayed out for seven months. Right. And that's when I really did a lot of videos. So you were away during that second lockdown period, were you? Yeah. I was like, I'm not coming back to that. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. Um, that I, you know, I had connections with back here, but I'm not coming back to that. I was sick of it. Mm -hmm. And those countries were the only places in the world where I had no restrictions. So... I went to Tanzania, spent three months in Tanzania, three months in Ethiopia. So I look back like, what was I doing? <laughs> a month in Uganda, I went to Somalia and um, came home. So I'm just interested, when you were in those places, obviously looking out at the rest of the world who were in lockdown and had all these restrictions, oh, what was the view both for you and the local people in those countries like looking oh, out at that? I felt guilty because I was out partying every single night in Tanzania, beach parties. There was zero restrictions, like zero. And everyone, there's an island called Zanzibar, just off the coast of mainland Tanzania. That was full of tourists, like full. And every night was party. And I'm looking back at my mates like, oh, yeah, we're back to four people in a room rule. I'm just like, guys, like, oh my God. Felt bad, I'm putting it on my you know, Instagram and stuff. And, um, but yeah, it was just different out there. So yeah, I felt super bad for everyone back here in lockdown, but I just wanted to live my life. Mm -hmm. uh, fair enough. Did you do uh, Kelly while you were out there? Who? Kilimanjaro. I seen it. My mate did it and he's a fit lad and he struggled. He couldn't complete it. And I wanted to do it, but it was expensive. It was like 3,000 mm. pound minus the tips. So you had to tip the guys at the end. So you're looking at like close to four grand. Mm -hmm. And it's like seven days or something. Yeah, I think so. And I was like, oh, <laughs> you know, I don't want to do that. Um, I would like to do a long, challenging trek. I've done quite a few, but Killy, yeah, maybe maybe I'll do it another time. No, fair enough. It is hard. My mates said they were carrying a body down on the way back. <sighs> so it's, I think like 30 people die every year. Is it? Doing Killy. I might be wrong there, but I think that's right. Okay. It's hard. It's just like a flat terrain, gradual incline. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah, I looked at it years ago to go, and um, I think I was looking at the Mashame route, which I think was five days up and then like a day down, but that's quite a hard route, I think, as you said, there's slower ones. But, you know, going back to the lockdown thing, I did, I did, I, I was looking back at all your early content, and I did notice that you started, I think, around 2018, and there was obviously that period, so I was curious to see how you navigated that. Yeah. What, what sort of uh, subscriptions are you on now for YouTube? It's quite big, isn't it? Um, I think it's over 300k. Yeah, that's amazing, yeah. mate. Yeah. Brilliant, well done. Thank you. And when did you see that really kind of pick up? Um, well, I know you want to ask me about Mr. Bold. Yes, it's picked up point. massively when uh, obviously I started traveling with him. Before that, I predominantly like an, I guess, uh, Asian audience because I've just gone to Asian countries. Mm. And now I've got predominantly a UK based, US based, Australian, Canada. So, yeah, obviously I thank him a lot for helping me in that sort of boost of subscribers. Mm. Yeah, I think it's 300K or something, yeah, 300K. Yeah. I, don't, I don't care about numbers. I just care about the engagement and people watching. But yeah, grateful for everyone that watches and subscribes. It's awesome. So we'll come to, uh, to, to your friend there in a second, Mr. Bold. But that's sort of go through a bit of a timeline, I guess. I'm, I'm curious to, to maybe go back to that first trip to India. Mm -hmm. And I guess for you to, to maybe tell us about that experience. So maybe, you know, was there, a, was there any point where you were scared? Like what was the, 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 the sort of best memory you've got of that experience? Talk us through that trip. Of India? Yeah. So India was probably the most, that was the first place I went, which you can probably say is extreme because 
no one's really going there, right? It's not on not online. Obviously, Bold was going there um, with his mate Harold. They were filming it. And actually watching their videos, that's the reason I went. Because it was looked funny. It looked a great time. And the places I was going was, was a bit... It was touristy, right? Thailand, you know, all these places. I was like, I need something extreme. So I went to India. I'll be, I'll be honest, I was nervous. I was like, I don't know what to expect. You know, people my age aren't really going there. I landed in this city called Jaipur, and I'll never forget it. It was like three o'clock in the morning. I've landed in like bloody, what I'm wearing now, flip-flop shorts, a vest I had on at the time. So I've just flew from Thailand. And it was freezing. I was like, oh, no, I thought India's meant to be hot. It was freezing, so I landed in winter. It's like minus three or something. Oh. Outside, there must have been about 200 people sleeping on the airport floor. Like outside it, homeless people. And I'm just like stepping over them to get to the taxi and i'm just like oh my god this is extreme this is full on and i'm like oh my god what have i done so i get into his taxi this rickshaw he's like took took things and he takes me to the hostel and in this whole journey he's like he's asking me questions and i'm like is this guy kidnapping me like I, I honestly i didn't know what to expect he's asking me like really weird questions like if he was asked these questions here in plymouth you'd be like these are strange questions and i was just like bloody hell what am i doing woke up the next day Calm down a bit, you know, traffic's bedlam, it's crazy, you're walking around like, this is hardcore. But it was fine. Like, you realize after day one, people are friendly, it's safe, uh, to some extent, for some people. But, um, yeah, you know, that's it's, it's what you do, you go out of your comfort zone, and once you do that, you get used to it. Um, but India, as soon as you go there, that's like the ultimate culture shock, because it's just relentless, 24-7 all the time but you adjust to it you used you get used to it really quickly and i've been back like seven times now <laughs> yeah yeah is, is goa in india goa's in india it's yeah. a beach beached place yeah i've I, I know a couple of people have been to goa i don't know how real like india that is though i don't know if that's more sort of yeah it's an old portuguese colony yeah. um I, I went there actually like three months ago um it's just where the indians go for like holidays and stuff okay. so yeah it's yeah. like their version of Magaluf. Okay. <laughs> Benadorm or something. Yeah, I think the, um, I, I know I, I work with a couple of um, people from India at the moment and it, it seems they're quite like liberal and relaxed over there. They, they drink a lot and stuff, I think. Yeah, what what yeah, are the people huge... in India like? Yeah, they love to party. They love it. Yeah, you can have a great time there. You can have a laugh. You just got to be careful with like certain cities like Delhi, Mumbai, um, Kolkata, all these big hectic cities. Um not, not really my cup of tea. The best part about India is going into like the north, the Himalayas, uh, northeast India. You've got these like small states in the northeast that are like bordering China, um, beautiful places, great people. Um, but yeah, as for like the main capital, like Delhi, Mumbai, go, it's not really my thing. Um, yeah, so, but there's so much, it's huge. India's massive, like yeah, 1.5 so billion it? people, I think. And you'll be driving on like a, tiny bit on the map and you'd be thinking when's this going to end and it's like a 15 hour journey and you've just gone this much on the, the map it's insane <laughs> huge base yeah but i recommend anyone to go just get ready because it's going to be hardcore <laughs> yeah it just looks crazy i remember watching remember the old idiot abroad with cole pilkington mate, yeah that's, that's what inspired me to go yeah was it mate yeah, he's my hero i used to love that yeah. fucking program have you ever watched it yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, Hilarious. that's all I think about India. Whenever I think of it, where he's like walking through the street, they're just chucking like, shit at him and yeah. he's like, oh, fuck it out. That's what it's like. Yeah, you got to be careful there though because like there's a lot of like, you know, annoying scams and stuff like that. And it's just, it gets exhausting and the, the noise gets to you eventually. You see what it's like? It's the exact same, mate, with Carl Pilgrimson. Is it? Where he's just, he's gone out of his mind in his room, isn't he, at night? He's like, I can't believe how loud it is. Mate, it's the same. <laughs> they're honestly. just beeping, in there. Yeah, yeah. He's like, they're just beeping on their scooters and all night. And that's how I filmed it. So I went there with the same sort of mindset as Carl. Um, he's just saying what it is, you know? He's like, you know, this place is crazy. Yeah. And... Um, that's what I did as well. I think it's a really good way to do it because it's so relatable. When you're watching that sort of content, you can imagine yourself being in that hotel room being exactly. like, oh, I hate this. Yeah, 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 it's so true, mate. That's, that's, that's literally why I watch your content and, and similar content is because I want to see what these places are like to visit. Mm -hmm. 
without actually having to visit. Yeah. <laughs> like, of course, some I like to travel, but I mean, we'll come on to it in a bit, I'm sure. But there's obviously some really dangerous places out there. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm not prepared to put myself at risk with the family and everything. So I want to live vicariously through someone else and, and you provide that for your channel, which is amazing, which yeah. is why I enjoy your content. Um, tell us about Ethiopia. Ethiopia, um, yeah, I was there for three months, mainly because that was the, um, I left Tanzania after three months and I was like, where can I go now? There's no lockdown. Crossed into Ethiopia, same thing, no lockdowns, um, nothing. And you just make friends there. And I met a lot of friends that were British, Ethiopian. And at this point, I'm doing videos in Ethiopia. I did like 15 videos or something. And I got okay views, but um, a lot of British, Ethiopians watch it. So diasporas, I think the word is. And they're living there now in Ethiopia, linked up with them. And they gave me loads of advice, where to go, what to do. And yeah, I'd spent, looking back, can't believe I spent three months there, it's nuts. But yeah, to set up a little base, had the same hotel room for three months. And yeah, it was all right. Um, I went to some dodgy places in Ethiopia. There was a war going on as well at the time in the north between, I think, Eritrea and Ethiopia. Like it was proper like civil war going on. So you couldn't go to the north. But I went to a, a place called the Afar region, which is on the border of Somalia and Kenya, I think. And that place was nuts. There's no laws there. So they say to you, their government website even says, if something happens to you in this region, you're on your own. So what? I was like, I'm going. <laughs> so I went there. Yeah, I'd look at that and I'd avoid that, like the plague. Yeah. I'd be like... <laughs> I was nervous. It's also the hottest place on earth all year round. So I was there when it's 52 degrees. No way. 52. Um, I think the hottest place in the world is like in Iran or I think it's in America, actually, in Arizona. But all year round is in this place called... Um, a far region in Ethiopia. So I went there and it was so dangerous. And um, yeah, I spent three days traveling around to volcanoes and stuff like this. And he's like craters. But there's a group there called Al Shabaab. I don't know if you know Al Shabaab are. It, it kind of rings a bell. I it? think, are they, are they Islamic? Yeah, they're yeah. Um, Somalia based. They want to, I think they want to take over Somalia. Yeah. I might be wrong there. I don't know. But there was a bomb yesterday in Somalia and they were responsible for it. And, um, you know, so they're quite dangerous. And they, <laughs> word spread that we were in the region and they were looking for us. No way. And if they found me, it's game over because... Mate, what are you doing? Oh, that's <laughs> when I was like, what am I doing here? <laughs> but I was like, oh, it's either this or go home to lockdown in Fucking England. Hell, so, mate. But I wanted to see the volcano. So I went to see the volcano. It was nuts. But to get there, you've got to go through these regions of like, you know, danger and stuff. And yeah, it was nuts. Volcano was there. A active volcano. The active volcano, yeah. I've seen oh, the magma wow. and stuff. Did you? But only for like a split second because it spits out this like toxic fume. As soon as you look over, you inhale it, you're coughing your guts up straight away. And so I, all that for like a second. I was like, oh, great. That's pointless. And I just want to clarify this point for the audience because I'd be wondering this if watching. You're not traveling with like an armed security like detail or anything, are you? Oh, yeah. So... You go, basically, it's, it was like a tour, basically. And I yeah. went with my British Ethiopian mates. Yeah. There was like four of us. And um, we went to this region. When you get to the region, you go to this like office and then they assign you an armed guard. Okay, so you do have an armed guard with you. Yeah. And then you go to this area where the volcanoes and stuff are. It's like a three-day drive, by the yeah. way. And you're going through the most remote desert ever. And another thing as well. The AC broke in our car. Oh. So we're driving through this like desert. One car had AC, one didn't. So we're rotating. I, di I didn't get out the AC car. I was like, I'm not fucking leaving this AC car. <laughs> <laughs> I was like saying to my British sheep opens, you guys, you guys do that. Like I'm staying here. <laughs> um, but yeah, you eventually pick up this guy with a gun and he escorts you around. And it wasn't even loaded. I asked him, is it loaded? And he was like, no, it's just to scare them off if they come. I was like, for fuck's sake. Like, <laughs> Uh, we ran out of water uh, two or three times and there's points where you're driving through the desert for like six, seven hours. If you break down, you're dead because it was 52 degrees. I was just like, what is this? It's because I did it on a backpack and budget, right? And the tour cost like 200 quid for like three days, everything included. Mm -hmm. We stayed in some of the worst hotels you can ever imagine. And um, basically like a straw hut on the side of the road. And... It was nuts, mate. Honestly, it was nuts. But you get assigned a guard with a gun. But obviously, it was pointless. But um, 
yeah, these this region doesn't have a law. Yeah. So anything happens, you're on your own, basically. Yeah. And the rest of the time you were just moving around like this region or, or that part of the world. Did you have any security then or was it just for that trip? No, that was just for like two days. Right. Okay. And then you solo again okay. for the rest of Ethiopia. But you got tribes in the south. We went to the south of the tribes um, and in a place called Omo Valley. And this is like proper tribe. Like this is um, extreme. And they've got all these like tattoos and stuff. And they have these like lip things. Have you seen this before? The discs. Yeah, the lip discs. Yeah, yeah. So we went to see them. Uh, you don't have a guard for that because you're giving them money. So they're happy for you to come. But Ethiopia is, um, yeah, it's, it's another massive country. There's so much to see. And so it's so different each region. It's not like Plymouth is, and then Newcastle, you know what I mean? It's, we've got a different accent. There, it's like you've got tribes there, you've got Al Shabaab up there, and you've got mountains on the left. It's crazy. It's an interesting place. And when, when you found out Al Shabaab were looking for you, terrified. How, how did you find that out, first of all? So, the locals, we went to this like desert towns every like six, seven hours, and they came up to us. Obviously, they spoke in a local language. Um, I forgot what it's called, actually. And all of a sudden, this uh, the locals are, like panicking a little bit. I'm like, "What's going on? What's going on?" They goes, "Oh, Al Shabaab, like looking for you guys. They've heard you there." I was like, "Oh my god!" And um, yeah, they were just looking for us. Don't know what to do, but <laughs> I was like, "Shit!" Did you leave the country at that point? No, I was there for another month after that. <laughs> Fucking hell, but mate. It, you're in a different region. <laughs> right, okay. So like, I'm um, this is like 15 hours away from the capital. Yeah. So there's there's loads of uh, tourists that go to the capital of Ethiopia. Um, so they're not going to come look for me in Addis Ababa. Addis they were just trying to pick you up if you were in yeah, the area, exactly, basically. Yeah, we're in, a, we're in their area. So they're like, like I said, there's no laws there, right? But I didn't know they were there until I got there. And I was like, right, let's get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we still had like another day of driving. So yeah, it's crazy. So terrifying. Mate, I, when I was quite young, I was a bit naive then. I went to, I went to Egypt for the first time. Oh, yeah. And I went to uh, Tabor, which was up in the north near Israel. And I can remember when we got the bus, we flew into the airport, which I think was like the, the smallish, smallest international airport in the world at the time. It was like an ex-military airport. And it was absolute chaos when I arrived there. It wasn't like Sharm. No. Completely different. And then we drove on a bus, like from the airport to the resort through like the Sinai Mountain. And there were two armed guards on the bus. And I can remember like not expecting that at all. And seeing the armed guards and thinking, why the fuck do we need armed guards? I'm now shitting <laughs> myself. So I can only imagine, mate, like how you must have felt in that sort of place. When with you're no in those law. situations, it's crazy, isn't it? Egypt's yeah. like that, yeah. Sharm yeah. El Sheikh's a tourist place. That's where a lot of the tourists go. Uh. Her Gader, I think it's called. Uh. Um, and a couple others. Um, but when you go to rural parts of Egypt, it's extreme. Mm. Well, I land in Cairo. Cairo is just... Oh. I've been to Cairo, mate. It's the most, the most insane city I've ever been to in my life. Oh, just, there's no words. But I went to on the west towards Libya and Siwa, it's called Siwa or something. And um, you've got to get like a 15 hour bus to get there. But there's so many military checkpoints. They get off, they, you have to get on, get off. Bloody, they've all got guns, they're checking for your bags, asking you questions. Oh, you journalist, blah, blah, blah. So you see a camera, right? And I'm like, oh God, here we go. And they hate the camera in Egypt as well. They're really bad with it, aren't they, in yeah, Egypt? Yeah. Because um, I watched the... Uh... World's best food reviewer. Have yeah, you watched I him? love his vids, mate. Yeah, I so, love uh, his vids. Have you watched his one where he goes to Egypt? Seen it, mate. His experience is, is exactly spot on. That is wild. He went on Joe Rogan. Yeah, yeah. And I w I've watched him for years. Mm -hmm. And then the Me one too. he went to Egypt, mate, you can't believe it. Like, they basically, like, confiscated all his stuff. Yeah. Give it back to him. They followed him round. Like, they were, like, harassing him. So he like had to, like, get... A like he basically like trying to lose them. They kept every time he was filming, they would come up and go, "What? What if you just film?" Yeah, we're like oh, nothing. And then he was hiding content. They confiscated it, give it back, confiscated it. Mate, it it was a different level. When it is that was like for you, was it exactly the same? Yeah, you can't relax. Even you're at the pyramids, and you're filming it. People come up to you like claim to be police. What are you doing, mate? I'm at the fucking pyramid. Like, I'm doing a video. They're like, no, no, no. You need permit. I'm like, oh, they're after some money or something. Um. It's non-stop there, honestly, yeah. non-stop. Uh, one of my least favorite cities is Cairo. See, I was going to go there a few years ago and I, my mate went there and he put me off so much yeah. from it. And a few of my family members put me off so much from it. I was like, you know what, I'm not actually going to go. I went to Tunisia instead and that was terrible. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, I've been there as well. We didn't need the resort, mate. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah, yeah, honestly, sometimes it's not worth it in certain countries. Just book your ho- book your holiday resort and stay there. Yeah, that's what we done in Tunisia. We we got to Tunisia, went down the road, and Kirsty, we was only like 22, 23. Kirsty was blonde, blue eyes, and they literally went, do not get in a taxi yep. because there's been kidnappings of blonde girls. Um, don't do this, don't do that. So we were like, all right, so we can't basically leave our hotel. It's they true, went, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what's the point of coming? Yeah. What's the point of coming? Yeah. I, mean, I was in Cairo with my girlfriends, but we were like, again, sort of on a guided, it was like a, a trip to the pyramids, the shops and stuff. Guided at all, best way. Yeah, and she, she was like, she was dark hair, which kind of helped a little bit, but she was quite tall and slim and had tiny shorts on. I can remember the first time we stepped off the bus in Cairo, mate, it was like, it was like a mix between a car crash and a Western film where everything just screeched to a halt. Everyone started like hanging out the yeah. car windows. I was like, we need to get Awful. off the street right away. They all called white chicken. And I always <laughs> laugh about it. They used to go, white chicken, come here, white chicken. Oh, and no, I, used be like, Boy. I used to be like, leave her alone. Yeah, leave her alone. Like yeah. it's, it's relentless, mate. We used to be on the beach and the, the complex was on the beach. Yeah. And we'd be sat on the beach and they'd be like trying to wake us up, calling, oh, white chicken, come with me, come with me. <laughs> I was like, shocking, this is fucking shocking wild, behavior. isn't it? Yeah, I remember with Cairo when I was driving in, because they've got the massive roads there, haven't they? They're huge, like five or six lanes. And I can remember driving in, looking out the bus window, and I saw a guy trotting along on a, like a, on a car being pulled by a donkey. Um, towing something on this motorway, basically. And this like brand new Audi like swooped by and just cut him up. Like nearly caused a donkey to, to, to buck and everything and, and just drove off. And I remember when I got to the city, I thought that like, that was a good reflection of the city in the sense that you'll be in the city, it's an absolute shithole, looks like it's a bomb site. Mm-hmm. And then you've got a really posh like car shop at the end of it. It's just really bizarre. So random, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'd never go back there. I've no. seen the pyramids. Get out. Honestly, is my opinion. There's you apparently got new Cairo. It's meant to be quite nice. Right. But old Cairo is where a lot of tourists go. Non-stop. You can't relax. You know what it's like. And um, relentless. Yeah. W- one and done, mate. One and done. Yeah. So you've obviously been to, you know, the sort of Middle East a fair bit. You've been obviously a load of places, mate. I mean, where is like? Give us, give us a quick rundown of some of the really obscure places that you've been and then tell us where you feel that like the most dangerous place was that you visited from what the government you know says you know the, the 10 most dangerous so i've been to afghanistan i've been to syria i've been to iraq twice i've been to pakistan three times i've been to parts in brazil where the favelas and stuff are colombia somalia well somaliland is a little area in somalia so i guess you can say i've been to these dangerous countries but I've never had any, well, I've had some scary situations, which, which we'll talk about. But um, I've never been in, you know, extremely dangerous situations where I'm thinking I'm going to die. Um, most of the time, quite the opposite. Um, 95% of my experiences have been positive. Interesting. Yeah. So I know you've also visited several places in the UK as well. And I think I watched one that I, I watched it recently. I don't know when it went out, but you obviously visited a couple of council estates in London. Yeah. Tell me like your comparison of like like those places you just mentioned and the sort of most dangerous places in the UK. May I feel more safe in these other countries that I just mentioned than I do in the UK. I'm not even joking. Even here in Plymouth, we've spoke about it off camera. Like you can't even go out on a night out in Plymouth without getting like started on, can you? Just like you look at one person the wrong way. They're like, fuck are you looking at? I'm like, what? <laughs> this doesn't happen in these other countries like it's just crazy and like other parts in the uk like i've been to like birmingham some of the roughest estates in london you know manchester even parts of scotland and i'm just like fucking hell like this is i feel i feel on edge you know what i mean like i don't know if you've been to these certain areas in the uk and you just feel like you just feel on edge yeah because you know what they're capable of as well well you've seen yeah. the news like stabbings and stuff and me and Paul grew up in those sort of areas, and you know what people are capable of. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know. Yeah, but, but you say that, though, as much as they're capable of maybe stabbing you or beating you up, they're not going to shoot you and cut your head off. I don't know, mate. Well, maybe. <laughs> but, you know, again, if you believe what you see in the media... But these uh, things yeah. are happening in the UK. Yeah, but it, it, you'd be led to believe that those things happen far more often in, in the Middle East, in of Afghanistan. Course. yeah. So it feels like on paper, according to the press, you should be far more scared like in these countries than the UK. So it's interesting to, to kind of get that perspective. Why do you think that difference is? Is it, is it like, yeah, I don't know. You tell me, what do you think? Well, first of all, I'm not saying all these countries I went to are safe. No. Like, the stuff that goes on there is horrible, right? Like some of the stories you hear are just like horrendous. But I'm just saying like I feel 
safer at times walking around these countries and than I do in the UK. It's probably because you're a foreigner, right? You're walking around, they're not used to seeing foreigners, so like, hey, and they want to show the hospitality. And the hospitality in these countries are next level, like so friendly, like honestly, these people, like in Afghanistan, these people have nothing, right? It's the poorest country in the world. They make $10, $10 a month and they're just so friendly and they want to give everything to you for free. You go into a shop and they're like, you say like, oh, how much is this? Like, no, 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 have it, have it. I'm like, what are you talking about, have it? And the meals are free. Obviously, we don't take it. We pay them 10 times the amount, whatever, anyway. Taxis, like, they don't they don't accept your money. I remember I was in Iraq. I was in Iraq for like an hour. The Baghdad traffic is hell. Like, it's awful in Baghdad for traffic. I was in it for an hour. And this taxi driver was just like, oh, brother, you spoke okay English. He was like, brother, I'm in traffic my whole life. I wake up, I'm in 6 a.m. traffic, 10 p.m. traffic. So I was like, Jesus. And he spoke to speak about football and stuff like this. And anyway, we get to the final destination. I'm like, oh, how much, mate? He's like, it would have been like four quid anyway. But he's like, ah, oh, no, 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 no. I'm like, nah, like no way. So he would refuse my money, right? It got to a point where I'd have to throw it at him. <laughs> and then I jumped out of the car and run away. I turn around, he's chasing after me in the money. I'm like, no, my God, this is insane. So I run into a shop and I'm arguing with him in the shop, take my money, man. I'm not, I'm having a proper argument over taking my money. It's insane. And in the end, I, I didn't take it because he just wouldn't accept me um, paying. I was just like, that's just insane. That wouldn't happen in the UK. Mm. Like, it's just like hospitality in these countries, they open your mind. So like, it's not all dangerous. Like you go into the government websites of these countries, like Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, all these places, it's red, do not go. That's what it says. Mm. Nah, it's, you meet some great people and it opens to your mind. Like not everyone's a terrorist or not everyone's gonna kill you. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of great people out there. It's the 1% in these countries that ruin it for everyone else. Like it is 1% in this country that ruin it for everyone else, isn't it? Yeah. So it opens your mind to what's really out there, what people are like. Um, but I am not, I'm not saying go to these places. I'm just saying go with an open mind, but be careful. Don't trust everyone and you'll have a great time. And then within the UK, so we'll, we'll do this in the UK and then overseas, but you kind of obviously mentioned there's been several dangerous cities and places that you've been to. Like in the UK, both on paper and in your own experience, what did you feel was like the most dangerous place that you've been or the worst situation you were in? In the UK? Yeah. Um, or was it okay? I've never been like, I felt like oh, I'm going to get killed here, but you do feel on edge because you walk around with a camera, right? Like trying to make a video and people think, oh, are you an undercover cop? Because um, me and Bol went to Birmingham, right? And we went to places where we stand out and we're filming these streets and stuff. People thought we were undercover police. <laughs> so what a gang, they, I'm guessing they were gangs and stuff because you see a lot of drug dealings on the side, right? And um, in these certain areas in the UK, like they, they, don't, they don't hide it. You walk past the broad daylight, they're all dealing drugs and like, I've seen people shooting up and stuff in like, but broad daylight. I'm just like, what is going on? Like, this is crazy. So me and Bob walk around with camera and they're like, police, police, like police. And they all run away. So yeah, there's certain parts of the, the UK are just like crazy. And it's, it's just a shame because people think of the UK as this like heaven on earth country to come live. And then you go to certain areas and you're just like, bloody hell, like this is the UK. And it's like, yes, it is. <laughs> so it's a shame. Yeah. And then same question, but yeah, overseas. What was that? That was my phone. So oh, that was my, uh, my watch buzzing for some reason. Telling me there's jujitsu class on that I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so same question, but now that overseas. So where well, was on paper the most dangerous place you've been to? And, and was there ever an occasion where you, other than obviously El Shabaab, another occasion maybe where you were like, fuck, I'm in real trouble here. Afghanistan, mate, I thought it was game over. Like, I was just like, I've got, a, it's a bit of a story. If I ran on, Please interrupt. No, carry on, carry on. So sir. Afghanistan obviously got took over by America for a number of years. And then all of a sudden, one day, they picked up and left. They fled and left everything behind. So they left all their military, all their helicopters, all their military, um, what do you call it? Like vehicles, tanks, you name it. They left it all behind, billions of it. And they just ditched it one day. They all left. So Taliban all came in, took over straight away took down the Afghanistan flag, put up the Taliban flag, boom, this is Taliban Afghanistan now. So 
at this point, I was in Pakistan, right? For the second time traveling around. No, actually, that was a month later. So it was quite soon after anyway. So my mate, Ben, not bold Ben. This is another guy called Ben, who's an absolute nutter. He goes to some of these dodgy countries and doesn't even film it. Doesn't even take photos. He's just into these like dangerous travel experiences. <laughs> so he went and he was the first, he, he, we're in Pakistan. He was like, right, Ben, do you want to go to Afghanistan? I'm going, I'm going next week. I was like, fuck no, <laughs> like no chance. <laughs> Like Pakistan was intense enough because we were on the Peshawar border next to Afghanistan. Guns everywhere. There's Taliban there. I'm just like, not a chance, mate. Not a chance. So anyway, he went and I didn't hear from him for three days, right? I thought he was dead, man. Eventually he gets sick. No, he texts me and he's like, mate, I'm having the best time of my life. Like you should have come. I was like, fuck's sake, I regret it now. Anyway, he did like a five day trip, came back, left. So three or four months later, um, a couple other people have gone. Um, this Scottish lady called Emma went, right? She's a, a YouTuber and she's, um, I've spoke to her a few times. She went and she had a crazy experience. So I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to go. At this point, I've met Bold. We did the UK road trip and we're still, you know, we're still mates, st staying in touch. So I say to him, look, mate, I want to go to Afghanistan. Do you want to go? And he's like, Afghanistan, is it possible? I'm like, yeah, my mate Ben went. And he's like, how do we go? I was like, well, apparently you can go from Pakistan and cross the border or fly in, but I want to go from Uz Uzbekistan. So I went to Ukraine. I did like um, a week in Ukraine during the, during the war just to see what's going on. I, I went to like the areas and stuff, not the actual conflict areas. I went to the parts where it got destroyed and it was bad. And then I flew to, from there to Kazakhstan. Then I went to Uzbekistan. So I went to the Uzbekistan Afghanistan embassy and that embassy, I walked in, and honestly, it looked like this, this little room and this little cage office. And I walk in like, excuse me, you speak English? They're like, yes. I'm like, where are you from? He goes, I'm from Afghanistan. I was like, I want to go. And he was like, no, you're not allowed. I was like, please, like, I, I want to go. He was like, I'll have to look into it. I spent a week in Uzbekistan sorting out a visa. Text and bar, like, listen, mate, we can come, but you need to come here as well, because he speaks Russian, right? So they speak Russian in Uzbekistan. Anyway, after a week of negotiating, we finally get the visa. However, the day before we left, we get a call from the British embassy saying, excuse me, is this Ben? I'm like, hello, yes. He goes, this is uh, David Smith, whatever his name was, from the British embassy. We've been told you're going to Afghanistan tomorrow from the Uzbekistan embassy. I was like, uh, yeah, how did you know that? He goes, well, they told us. We strongly advise, we had our flights are booked at this point, right? Got the visa, we're ready. He goes, do not go. We've just spent three years getting out some journalists from Britain that went there and that had been arrested for three years by the Taliban. I was just like, me and Bob were listening like, oh my God. So we're shitting it. And we're just like, fuck. So we hang up and we're like, bloody hell, what do we do? So we were going to bail, but we woke up and we were like, right, what do we do? Let's go to the airport. Let's have a few drinks. So we go to the airport, we have a few uh, whiskeys, and you know what alcohol does to you, right? It loosens you up. So we're having some whiskey. Before you know it, we're tipsy. We're on a plane. We're flying to Afghanistan, land in Kabul, and we're just like, oh, my God, we're in fucking Afghanistan. <laughs> so, like, at this point, we're sobering up as well, and I'm just like, shit, like, what have we done? And there's Taliban everywhere. Walk around with RPGs, their flags are everywhere, guns, you name it. I'm just thinking, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing? So we get to this hotel and our local that's showing us around, just like laying down, the, laying down the rules. Don't film this. Don't do that. Don't talk to these people. I'm just like, shit. We had an amazing first day. It was absolutely incredible. We're walking around. People are like so friendly. Like I've never experienced hospitality like it. We have a few encounters with the Taliban. They look at us like, hey, where are you from? And... Um, we're just like, England's. They're like, oh, England's. You shout out a football team and they'll go, oh, Rooney. Or it just lay, you know, it calms things down a bit. And day one was fine. Day two, we traveled through the mountains. And this is where we got stopped by the Taliban on a rural mountaintop. Now I'm talking like in the middle of nowhere. Searching our bags. And this is where they bloody, they go through my bag and they're looking like stuff off. Oh, Hair dryer, what the fuck's this? So, <laughs> they probably think it's a weapon, right? I'm like, nah, hair dry, hair dry. And they're like, oh, what's it? No English or anything. So they're going through Bold's bag. 
Now, a day before, as a joke, I had a Johnny in my in my con in my wallet. Oh no! A condom. I know where this is going already. So I just went. I threw my condom in Bob's uh, backpack, and they're going through his backpack, and they look at it and go, "Haram, haram," <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh my god, they found a condom." <laughs> I'm like, shit, hopefully they don't know what that was. They knew what it was, right? So I'm just like, oh my God. So there's this huge, like, they all come running over with guns on this mountaintop. And I'm just like, holy shit. Like, we're all like shitting ourselves, me bold and this Afghan guy. <sighs> Eventually, after about half an hour, it calms down. We drive off. We go to the next town, which is like, it's like mountain region. So we get brought into this office to get this permit. And this is where I was just like, oh my God, what are we doing? So we get led into this compound, this old US compound. So the Taliban have taken over the US compounds, right? Do you remember watching like Ross Kemp in yeah, Afghanistan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you go. So do you know when he goes to like Helmand province and he's in these like compounds? So the Taliban are in there now. We get took into those. So we open these gates, armed guards everywhere. And I'm just walking in, just like, what the fuck? They are all staring at us. They've all got RPGs. They're like all like massive beards, guns. So we get led up to this room and uh, Bold's just like, Bold's actually quite chill at this point. I am shitting myself, right? I'm just thinking I am arrested now for the next 10 years. I'm going to be like the journalist that got arrested, right? So we get led into this room and they were super friendly. They were so friendly, but they didn't speak English, right? So eventually... Um, our guide barely spoke English as well. He just saying, relax. But he keeps saying, like, relax, brother, relax. He can see me like, uh, fucking hell. And Bold's looking at me like, mate, calm down. I'm, I'm, mate, I'm fucking, this is it. We're over, mate. Like, this is it. This is what I'm, the people said. Don't go to Afghanistan. This is it. And we fucking come. Like, why have we done this? And he's like, calm down. Be all right. He was nervous on the mountaintop when he found the condom. I was all right, to be fair. But we're switched now. I'm nervous in this room. Anyway, so... In walks about 25 of these big bearded Taliban members with these huge hats. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is full on. Like, am I dreaming? What's going on here? And that's it. We stood up. Ah, salam alaikum. And they're like, oh, so alaikum salam. Like, uh, welcome to Afghanistan. I'm like, holy shit, these guys are friendly. Thank God. They gave us a permit that literally looked like this, stamped it. And they were like, you're free to explore Afghanistan. Any problems? You're fine. I was like, Oh my God, thank God. So in this room for like, I don't know, half an hour, they let us go. And that's it, we cracked on. But for that half an hour, hour interrogation, they're asking us questions and stuff. Like, are you journalists? Who do you work for? It's like, no, tourists, tourists. Did you like show them your YouTube or anything? Like no, that? no way. Because if they seen that, they'd be thinking, this is news, right? This is like media. They don't, they don't know what YouTube is. Yeah. YouTubes haven't gone there to make YouTube videos. Like, yeah. they had no idea. So we had a great three days after that through the mountains, zero problems, met countless Taliban, no issues, super friendly. Is that because you had that permit then? Permit, yeah. yeah that so you could just bang, like, see, see yeah. you later. Yeah, They'd be like, oh, I'm like, jog on, mate. Well, I've got <laughs> They'd be like, ah. But the thing is with the Taliban, they don't like each other in different regions. It's weird. Like they've got their own different like laws, one region than the other. So... You go to one region, they're like, oh, no, we don't like this Taliban group. Like, you need this permit. So eventually we get back to Kabul after three or four days. We get stopped on the road. And that led us into another Taliban headquarters where we were in that room for five hours till midnight. And these people were pissed off. They didn't like us. They were like, why are you here? At this point, we've been to gun markets, all these, all these like crazy places filming it. We took our SD cards out. <laughs> and shoved them in our hats, just in case they searched it. Um, we had, you know, we're filming stuff that we think they're gonna not like this. After five hours of interrogation, they're asking us questions. They were like, here's your permit, get out. They weren't friendly, these, these lot. We went home that day in the hotel, shit on ourselves, booked the next flight to Dubai the next day. <laughs> but yeah, Afghanistan, that was my 10 minute rant, how that was the, well, dodgiest situation i've ever been in and were you thinking you said that that's it we're going to get arrested were you thinking that it was just like sales for 10 years or were you thinking they might yeah. actually kill you at that point not kill me but you've i've seen so when i was building up to the trip you know i'm looking at like journalists that have been to prison because of the taliban uh, i think lad bible did a video there was this guy that was in prison for months um 
because the Taliban arrested him because he was an undercover journalist. Mm. Oh, that's what I thought. Oh, they're going to arrest me. But there's another YouTube called Lord Miles. Do you know about this guy? So he's um, UK based, um, does YouTube videos as well. And he went to Afghanistan about two, he went there before us anyway, but he did. He went there like two months later after me and bowled again. He got arrested because um, he didn't have a permit or something. Now these permits, if you don't have it, big no-no, but me and Bold didn't have any permit. Luckily, we charmed our way out of it. Bold's very good getting his way out of tricky situations. I think if it was just me, I'd still be in prison to this day. <laughs> I'm not joking. Bold's cracking jokes and stuff, like calming them down. And um, this Miles guy didn't have a permit. He was in prison for six months in a Taliban prison, right? So Imagine that. He got let out three or four months ago, I think. Yeah. That could have been us. You wouldn't even know what would happen in those prisons as well. You know what I mean? Like, he said it was great. He just actually say there, it was all right? Just, they, the food in Afghanistan is fucking unreal, by the way. Like kebabs, <laughs> rice, proper meat, proper food. And he said he was just eating that all the time. And they were all right with him in there? Yeah, he said they all loved him because he was like pro-Afghanistan. <laughs> so that's, that could have been me involved. So... Mm. Yeah, there you go. Wow, an experience. And was there any other occasions where you were maybe not in such a, a dicey situation, but where you were a little bit like, oh, this is this is not good? Um, well, certain countries like Syria, you'd think you would. Unfortunately, Syria is blown to pieces. Mm -hmm. It's sad because Syria is, before the war, it was the most visited country in the Middle East in terms of foreigners going there. So UK would go there all the time just for a holiday. Beautiful, it's incredible country. And at an amazing time, um, not once did I feel in danger there, but you'd think I would have been, but I wasn't. Um, same with Iraq, like I had no dodgy situations in Iraq. People are great. Same with Iraq, like the North in Mosul is all blown to pieces, super sad, but people are great. How about Somaliland? What was that like? That was okay. Um, Somaliland is a district inside of Somalia where they claim it's their own country. They got their own flag, their own government, own currency. Super confusing, but it is technically Somalia, according to the UN. So it's, there's no country called Somaliland, according to the UN. Um, still Somalia. That was okay. Um, I was with some locals, so I had no issues. Um, another country I felt a bit on edge was Colombia, because Colombia is pretty hardcore, especially with the Venezuela situation. Mm. A lot of immigrants have come over into Colombia. And they're in like dire straits of desperation. They've got no homes or anything. It's all on the street. And I went to the barrios of Colombia a few times and I was too, I couldn't film because they're, they're following me, right? Like camera, 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 put your camera away. I'm like, fucking yeah, definitely. Because they've all got like, you know, weapons and shit like that. So Colombia was pretty dodgy, I'll be honest. Yeah, okay. And you obviously mentioned because you're a tourist, then you maybe get like a, you know, a bit of a warm welcome from uh, from a lot of the locals, certainly. Um, but when you're in these countries, obviously how they treat their own people may be very different to how they would treat a, a white blonde tourist. I mean, was there ever an occasion where you saw like really shocking things happening to like locals or the, yeah. the nationals? Could you tell us about that? Well, you look at the laws in Afghanistan for women, they don't have any rights, right? Nothing. They, I don't think they can even leave their homes. So I didn't even see any women there. I've seen a few, but... Maybe they've got reputation there, but it's predominantly men walk around on the street. Same in parts in Pakistan as well. Like, you know, it's not ideal. Um, but it's true. Like even in certain countries, like in Uganda, for example, I was in Uganda two weeks ago and they've got tribes in each district, right? So they were telling me the locals, the people in Uganda, by the way, are amazing. Like some of the friendliest people on earth, like, there's a reason they call it the Pearl of Africa, great people. But there's tribes in the north that border South Sudan and they don't like the, the South lot. They get treated with racism and stuff like this. So yeah, it is different for obviously me being a white, blue-haired, blue-haired, <laughs> blue-eyed, blonde person to go there. I do get obviously treated differently compared to local situations for sure, 100%. Yeah. And you mentioned about Venezuela. Uh, are you able to, get, is anybody able to get into that country at the moment? Yeah, loads of people have been. Bold went last year. I was okay. going to go, but I'll be honest, I shit myself and then go. <laughs> yeah, well, I wanted to ask if that's the sort of place that you'd visit. I had a flight booked to visit. Did you? And um, we were looking into it and we we're like, just before the, the flight went, he was like, 
Because I'd have spent like six weeks in South America. I'll be honest. I didn't speak to anybody because my Spanish is shit. I don't know. I don't know any Spanish. There's no Comastar, Cerveza, and hola. <laughs> so I didn't speak to anyone for six weeks. We're going to like super remote places in Peru, Colombia, and you you might get along. You might get away with a bit broken English in the capitals of these countries, but in the places we went, he speaks Spanish, so we had no issues. Honestly, I walk around. I don't speak to anyone. And in terms of making videos, it's not very interesting, is it? Because I'm walking around going, oh, oh, look at that. Hey, because obviously content for me is all about the people, not not me. It's all about speaking to locals and I can't speak to anyone. So that was the main reason I didn't go to Venezuela. And also what's going on at the moment. I was just like, like we met another YouTuber in Colombia that said like, oh, if you go to a camera, they'll think you're a journalist. Boom, you're in prison. I was like, fuck's sake, like. I don't speak any Spanish. Bold will get his way out of it. He'll be like, oh, you're a tourist, whatever, in Spanish. Me, I'll be like, I'm clearly a journalist. So I didn't go. I went to Mexico instead. He went to Venezuela. Zero issues. Said it was amazing. I think he went back again. So, yeah. You mentioned, I think, that you say Bold speaks Russian, Spanish. Yeah. So he's obviously, like, multilingual. Yeah. Can you speak any other languages? No, terrible. Is it something that you, like, that you're thinking about learning? I've tried numerous times. Can't do but it. Do you know what it is? It's our accent as well. It's Think our so. Jana horrible accents. <laughs> when I say, oh, even como estas? I'll be like, como, hola, como estas? They'll be looking at me like, what? <laughs> it's our accents are too strong. And compared to Bold, he has this, like, he has like a proper British, ooh, I'm from England sort of vibe, doesn't he? So he puts this like Spanish twang to it and they all understand what he's saying. So I was just like, oh, I can't be bothered. Like this, why, <laughs> I should really, but it's like, I've been to these countries now. I'm not going to go back. So I don't need to learn them. Yeah, because I, I, I've been to Brazil and I think just, I think South America is the same, but even in Brazil where they speak Portuguese, the second language they is do, Spanish. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they just don't speak English. I was there yeah. with a Brazilian. Um, so again, he got me by, but even at the airport trying to get a subway, the mess I ended up with trying to get what I wanted was, <laughs> was a joke because the guy even in the airport, which is an international, could not speak English. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so I guess, yeah, without, without the language, it might be quite challenging. And I, I, I think as well as, a, as an adult, if you've not like grown up on multiple languages, I think learning as an adult is quite tough. Yeah, super hard. Yeah, I think I, I've the, before Brazil and, and before a few other places that I've traveled, I've tried learning a bit and it's, yeah, it's so fucking yeah, hard. Yeah, like, the, the, just like basic, I'm trying to think of a language. I think Thai, peop, fair play to any foreign that's learned Thai or any other language is solid. Like, it's like pie, 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 pie. Yeah, it's all tone, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's like, you've lost me already. Like, it's the same with... I don't know how hard Spanish is to learn. I'm guessing it's easier than Thai. I'm sure yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it definitely is. But, um, fair play to anyone, honestly, that learns a language. It takes pure dedication. I've had Duolingo on my phone for months. So <laughs> I have this reminder coming out, oh, Duolingo? I'm like, no. <laughs> Imagine like learning Russian. Like that just... Yeah. Yeah, honestly. even reading it and writing it, you know. But but I think the issue is as well. I think English is quite different to other languages. I think it's kind of close to German in some degree. But from what I understand, speaking to people that are multilingual, English is quite a hard language. I watched a um, TikTok the other day about that, about like the different pronunciations I've of the same that. words. Yeah. I was crying at it. I was like, yeah, if you're a foreigner, how are you going to know that? Yeah, but I think what's confusing, like Ben was saying then about like, Thai, is they'll have the same word. Um, and they just say it with a different tone, which means loads of different things. Mm. Well, we've got like so many different words that mean the same thing. It's just yeah. so confusing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? and we've got the same words. That, yeah, to have the same meaning for the yeah. for, for different stuff. Yeah, or we'll say it in the same tone, but in a different context, and it means something completely different. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a word. I know exactly the video you're on about. Yeah, I was crying. It was like it was like out, and he was taking off like I don't know. He was saying like clout, and then he was like that says out, and then he was putting like a different first letter on it and it changed the the sound of it completely yeah. and then he was taking off the t and then he was putting on a, a different word like a d and he was like this is now cloud yeah like, and then it is like, it is hard language yeah, yeah definitely it's really funny yeah. yeah so tell us about when you met bold then because we've we've mentioned to mentioned him a couple of times and obviously he's got a huge online following and it, it was his content that i watched first and then i think i came across yours as a result so tell us about how you guys hooked up yeah well mr bold legend top guy i owe him a lot for making my channel grow as well and he basically reached out to me because i went to syria i was one of the, i guess one of the first youtubers to go there and film it 
And Simon Wilson, I don't know if you know him, he's another YouTuber. Um, he does travel videos and he went with Bold like a month or two after me. So obviously they're doing their research like, who's been? Because like, there's no one been, right? And they discover my tiny channel with like, I don't know, a few thousand subscribers or whatever. And um, they're like, bloody hell, this guy's been. So when Simon was there in, um, on Instagram, he's posting stuff. I'm like, I message him like, hey mate, yeah, I just went. Cause I've spoken to him before this anyway. I've just went, great time, you have, a, have an awesome time. He replies like, yeah, I'm here with Bold now, mate. So obviously Bold's maybe seen my video, but he has, he told me. So he said, he's seen my videos um, a couple of weeks later, my experience or whatever. And he said, basically, I was one of the first people he's seen on YouTube, just keeping it real. Cause I went to Syria with four English lads and one German guy, we just got pissed up every night. It was fucking <laughs> awesome. Because Syria's got an amazing nightlife. Right. It's not what you think. It's not like some conservative country. There's right. bars everywhere. Our first night, we got smashed. And in the night, in the night proper nightclub, they were playing 50 Cent, stuff like this. We were like, it's fucking awesome. Like, this is so good. And I'm filming all this, right? I'm putting it on YouTube. So Bold seen it. He's messaged me and said, hey, mate, seen your Syria videos or whatever. Good to see someone just being himself on camera, having a laugh, not taking it too seriously. Do you have a driver's license? I was like, yes. So he said, oh, I'm gonna do the UK road trip, Land's End to John O'Groats, which is obviously north to south, or south to north, whatever. And um, can you drive? I was like, yeah, I can drive. Met him, um, he came down to Plymouth and he was just like, bloody hell, so what's it like around Plymouth? I was like, mate, it's, it's rough mate honestly it's not what you think obviously Plymouth's beautiful on the whole right it's stunning but he was like where's like the rough ends I was like mate honestly you, you will get started on I guarantee it within a minute of meeting bold this crazy old man was swinging a stick at us right <laughs> down Union Street and he was like fucking hell what's going on he's like I don't even get this in Soviet countries I was like mate it's Plymouth honestly go down to the Union Street walk around the um the hoe we get started on by some kids jumping off tombstone in they're like what are you looking at i was like fucking hell what's going on um and that's it we had a laugh and then we began the road trip the next day and it was a cracking time I had a lot of banter and stuff it was great and stayed in touch ever since and obviously went to i've been to like 20 countries with them now so yeah that's it we've been to all these countries ever since that first initial trip yeah, mate, he seems like a really cool guy, actually. And I see what you mean when you said earlier about how, like, just kind of quite relaxed and, and funny seems. Mate, honestly, I never knew. Obviously, I've seen his videos, but I never knew how famous he was until I met him in real life. Um, we're down Barbican, obviously, where you guys know on the hoe, drinking. First day I met him, he gets stopped four times by people like, oh, my God, bald and bankrupt. And I say to him, mate, do people, like, recognize you a lot? He goes, mate, all the time, like, all the time. So I'm like, okay, cool. Um, next day, we start at Land's End. Is it Land's End, the bottom one? Yeah, Land's End. So we're at the sign, welcome to Land's End. He gets stopped by like 10 people, all for selfies. People are like queuing up to say hello. I'm just like, what the fuck? Is, this guy's like mega famous. I had no idea. Obviously, I've seen his videos and stuff, but- How many subscribers has he got? Like 5 million or something. Oh yeah, yeah, he's gonna be, yeah. But it's like, it's not just YouTube, innit? It's like, it's spread over all platforms and stuff. So they might have seen, cause he's got a distinctive look, tall, big, bold guy with sunglasses and doesn't help himself. He wears the exact same clothes like me. So he gets recognized like that. And he's got this distinctive voice. Good morning. <laughs> and at times he doesn't want to get recognized. I'm like, mate, change your outfit and bloody stop talking like you do on YouTube then. <laughs> <laughs> so, I didn't realize how famous he was until I'm traveling around. Mate, in the UK, he gets recognized 100, 200 times a day. Like we just did a recent trip in the UK, in Scotland. It was every five minutes, every one minute was someone coming up to me. Oh my God, I bought a bankrupt, I bought a bankrupt. And like, I'm just like, Jesus Christ. And the thing, fair play to him, he's super humble. He will speak to every single person. He wouldn't be like, nah, no, sorry. Like, no, he would talk to them for any for like 10 15 minutes the same conversations right oh what happened to you in russia like you got arrested right or oh, what was afghanistan all these all these same questions it was it's exhausting and i'm stood there like 
yep, this is going to happen again in about a minute's time. <laughs> so we leave a minute later, boom, oh my God, board and bankrupt, board and bankrupt. Same questions again. And he'll just speak to him for 15 minutes. So fair play, super humble guy, great guy, honestly, the funniest guy as well. Like off camera, he is hilarious. On camera as well, but like um, off camera, funny guy, like funny, funny guy. A lot of YouTubers now like, are more famous than celebrities. If that makes yeah, you, I guess you know, so, Because yeah. they, people relate to them a lot more. And who There's a load TV? of YouTubers that I'd rather meet than celebrities. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I would. I would. Yeah. I'd rather meet them and chat to them because you feel like you get to know them a bit better. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about that potential for you, mate? Because obviously you're, you've grown massively in the last few years, last couple of years. And, you know, you keep going and then you may end up in a similar position. No, I'll never be like him. Nah, no way. He's a top, top five, like mm. he is. I'm just grateful for where I am at the moment. He's next. His videos are awesome. Like he's he's done the most crazy journeys ever. I've done some mega journeys, but I'll never compare myself to what he's done. Um, he's he's got like four million subscribers. I'm, I don't really chase numbers anyway. Yeah. I just wanna I take each day for what it is. Um, I don't get stressed out. Oh, this video's like done badly or whatnot. Um, he's earned it. He's you know he's put himself I've seen what How he's like how long has he been doing it for um I don't know like six years or something but he'll put his he'll really do research and like um it, he's 50 and he'll put his body through hell right have you ever seen that video where he goes to the space rocket no I don't think watch so. it it's nuts like no one will do this our age no one I think I saw one where he I think he was I think it was in Pakistan or India maybe where he like him and his he was with another guy and they jumped off a boat and started like swimming Oh, that's India with Harold. Yeah. yeah. Nutter. They, yeah. And then I think they started getting like... I'll probably do berate. that, to be fair. They started getting berated and then like threatened or something. They turn around and swim back. Hilarious. Yeah. What was it? Yeah. What, what, why did they get shouted out for? I think they were just threatened to be arrested for swimming in... Because in, I think they were on a, a ferry or a boat or something. And I don't know if it was going the wrong way or I can't quite remember. But they basically, well, fuck this. Let's just jump and swim. So they just started <laughs> swimming. And then as they were approaching, everyone was like, get out of the water. You're going to get arrested. And they were like, better swim back then. <laughs> yeah. Hilarious. He's a funny guy. Um yeah, he's yeah, a good guy. Yeah, he's fair play guy. to him. But yeah, no, well, uh, yeah, definitely check out his content if you haven't. Um, tell us where the fun, most fun place was that you, uh, you know, your favourite place where you had the most fun. Uh, I've got a list of five countries where I said are my favourites, um, but one of them would be Japan. Yeah. Just um, the more I travel, the more I realise I just love clean, safe places. I just want to relax, you know, and like have good food. <laughs> Japan, honestly, if you get a chance to go to Japan, it is, it's one of my favorite countries in the world. It's awesome. The people are so respectful. It's super safe. I hate being in a country where you got, you know, be careful of pickpockets mm. and like getting sick and all this stuff. Mm. Japan is pristine. Like you won't find any rubbish on the floor in Japan. It is unheard of. Safety is there's no crime in Japan. It's non-existent. You can leave your laptop on the coffee table in a shop. You can walk away for five hours. You'll come back. It's still there. Like, you can drop your passport on the floor. Someone will pick that up and hand it in. You can lose your phone. No one's stealing it. And the more I travel and more of these, you know, stressful countries I've been to, I just, I'm at the point now where I was like, oh, I love, like, just going to a country where it's just chill and people are respectful. Japan is number one for that. So... Yeah, I wrote Afghanistan in there just for the adventure side of it and the hospitality because of people. I wrote Uganda because I've been there twice now, technically three times, but Uganda is my favorite country in Africa because it's the people, awesome people, like so friendly. The banter, they get British banter as well. You know what British banter is like, it's different compared to any other country. Sarcastic, Sarcastic dark humor, right? Like it's different, like in between us, The Office, like Alan Partridge, they get it there. They get it. It's it's great, and you can just um, oh, it's awesome. Like one of my best friends, he married a Ugandan girl for that reason. He says the people are just great, and they get the British banter. And he told me about this before I went. I just messaged him. I was like, mate, it's so true. They're just awesome. So Uganda, um, I wrote Syria for things I explained before. Just like beautiful country, great place. And I wrote Brazil. You probably understand why, because mm. Brazil. It was massive Brazil, but I went, I traveled quite a lot of it and I enjoyed it. I liked the uh, atmosphere, the party lifestyle. Um, people are happy, people are so friendly. Mm. It's, it is a poor country, isn't yeah. it? And people are great, even in favelas. 
They say, don't go to the favelas. Nah, it's, favelas are great. If you're with the right people, you're fine. Literally, you're fine. Yeah. Yeah, there's loads. I remember when I was there, I was, we were looking at sort of things to do and there were loads of like tourist day trips to like the favelas. Yeah, go. So That's it doesn't seem that, that bad there nah, at all. honestly, tourists go all the time anyway. Yeah. Like you'll see groups of old ladies walking around. Yeah, yeah. You'll have no, no issue. If you go there solo, alone at night and you go, because you see drugs everywhere there, right? They're dealing crack and cocaine on the street broad daylight they've all got AKs you walk past them but if you do that solo at night time they're going to think you're a policeman or like what are you doing here they might question you obviously don't speak English so you're going to get into a tricky situation but you go with the right people zero issues you'll have an awesome time hmm. and the people are great so Brazil great place yeah I like Brazil a lot it was really cool yeah. I went to Manaus in the north oh you went there I want to go there but yeah. it was expensive to get it's like 600 quid one way for a flight <laughs> from Rio yeah, we, six hour flight that's yeah, how big it Brazil was is. it was about yeah. five and a half hours six hours yeah we um my friend because he's got family in brazil he got them to book it in brazil for us um and it, it seemed to be cheaper at the time oh, when okay, we pre-booked yeah. it but um that was that was probably the the place in brazil that i felt was it was a bit dicey yes um, tribal sort of zone yeah but a lot of spanish lot up there as well Venezuelans. and yeah, yeah yeah and i remember we were staying with his aunt who was in a gated community a, um, a gated community. Oh, was it a gay community? <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. Nothing wrong with that if it was. Paul was right in, wasn't he? <laughs> you know, gated. So, uh, so we felt pretty secure when we were at, in in the house. Yeah. But there was like one evening we went out to get some groceries, and uh, it was it was night time, and she kept running red lights. And I'm sat there thinking, why is she running the red lights? So I said to my friend in the front, I said, what, why is your auntie running the red lights? So we asked, and she was oh, yeah, you can't stop. Yeah, smash your window and take yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, like if you're approaching a juncture and you slow down, have a little look, and then you just keep going. <laughs> because if you stop at the red light, you'll get carjacked, you'll get robbed. And there was a section when we were driving down this street and it reminded me of, I don't know, like these old films that you used to see in like the ghettos in America and stuff where it was full of like Spanish and Mexicans and we're driving down and literally it was like car boots open, like music playing out the boots, like people with like white, like baggy, baggy like jeans, wife beaters, wife beaters yeah. like in the street, just yeah. everywhere. And I was like, it sat in the back, like tinted windows and I'm just in the back, this big fucking gringo. And I'm just like <laughs> sliding down thinking, fuck me, if they see me in this yeah, car, yeah. they're just going to stop it. Cause my mate was very obviously Brazilian. So was his, so was his auntie. But yeah, I can remember being really intimidated going down there. Yeah, that's exactly how I felt in Colombia. Yeah. Those, that, uh, those areas where I'm just like, I am standing up like a sore thumb here. Yeah. But I wanted to go to Manaus. Um, I'm actually going to go back to Brazil in January. So I'll definitely do that 100%. Yeah. 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 And then there's a, a national park there called Foz do Guazu as that's well. That's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah that yeah. was absolutely stunning. The waterfall. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable. But yeah, now Manaus was really cool. We went into the Amazon for a bit on like a trip. Yeah. And uh, we went to a tribe, but it was like very touristy. Tourist tribe, oh, was it? It was it, like, it was one of these tribes. You look at the photos and they're all in the traditional gear. As soon like, as you leave, that comes off. Yeah. Get their well, iPhones out. Well, actually, before we arrived, we were stood, like, got off the boat and we stood there. And you can kind of see, like, through the entrance of the of the village. And they've got these gates, but there was a gap. And I can remember just sitting, and I was looking through. And there's just this guy walking along in a football kit. <laughs> and he walked by and he stopped. They went... Scurried off and they come back in the headdress. And, like, ah! and I was like, mm. I was like at the Dominican Republic. Yeah, we went to like this amazing cave waterfall thing, yeah, and the, yeah. the water was so blue. And then it was supposed to be the same thing, like a tribe, like kind of run it around there. Yeah. And then you seen them all up in the top when you come out of the cave, all in their regular like yeah. shirt and trousers and that. And then they come down and got changed and done it like a it's tribal like dance. So, many places. Yeah. so but funny. I man. felt so bad though because they did like a traditional tribe dance, mm -hmm. and all, all the girls had got their boobs out and stuff. And you could just tell by their faces they were like, oh, man, "I'm just so degraded and I'm so embarrassed." It's embarrassing, yeah. It's, you yeah. feel a bit awkward. Yeah, yeah. massively. Yeah, yeah. felt really awkward. That but in Ethiopia, when I went to the tribes, it. they've all got their boobs and their dicks out. I couldn't even film it because I'm like, you should not allowed this. <laughs> so I went, I drove all this way for like three days and I couldn't even film it. Do you ever, do you ever worry about those like money and tribes and stuff like that? Yeah, they still exist in like Papua New Guinea and Papau, the Indonesian islands. Um, there's, they still exist out there. Yeah, but no, well, I don't worry about that. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm not going there. So <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask like, if there's places that are just completely like absolute no nos for I'll you I'll go anywhere mate yeah, would you really yeah I would yeah yeah. it's mental I'm trying to think actually where um, I wouldn't go a lot of people say because YouTube they look at North Korea as like ultimate like video um, opportunity but you have to go on a guided tour and you're extremely limited to what you can see 
So North Korea for me, I wouldn't. I, maybe I'll go, but not really. It's never really appealed to me. I know Bold and stuff wants to go there. I think it would just fascinate me to see what it's like. Hundred percent. Yeah, being I'd love there. to just, go. You see all the fake shops and the th- yeah, fake yeah, stuff, go, yeah. and you know what I mean. Just, just maybe to see what it's really like. Yeah, you know, yeah. that would be that would be super cool. But, yeah, but at the same time, you're dicing with death, and you, you know, <laughs> yeah. you get caught doing something that they don't like. You're you're, you're gone, and you're you're in yeah. prison for a long time. That's why I wouldn't go a bold because we're meaning to be dicking around, <laughs> they're cracking jokes and stuff, and I'm like, mate, fuck's sake, like Jesus. Yeah, mad, mate. And then um, we obviously asked about your favourite places. Tell us about some of the, like, the, the, the best experiences you've had, the, the single moments where you're like, this is fucking amazing. Oh, mate, so many. Just Top three. I couldn't even give you one top. It, it, it all like merges into one, doesn't it? Like more places you go, every country has got its highlight. Um, it's all about the people at the end of the day, who you meet. And you can, go to the, you can go to a great country, but if the people, if you don't click with the people, you don't really remember it. So there's so many countries that I have great memories of, but honestly, I, I couldn't say a specific, that was the best time, that was the best memory of my life, because there's so many. Like, it's all merged into one. And because I've traveled quite a lot now, I, I forget a lot of stuff. Like, I'll be sat there one day and I'll have a flashback of a place. I'm like, where was that? And like, have I been there? Like, it's weird. Like, um, yeah, strange. But there's so many great memories, but I couldn't, honestly, I couldn't give you top three yeah okay yeah all right so you obviously mentioned that you kind of starting to to really enjoy nice safe places now i mean do you ever kind of miss just having a regular life just being yeah. at home having a job yeah because traveling absolutely ruins me like my recent trip in africa i actually calculated it because i was stuck on a 10-hour bus i spent like 69 hours on public transport in the space of like 10 days so what's that that's that's nearly three days out of 10 on a bus mm. so uh, it ruins me i got the worst posture ever look at me i'm just like <laughs> i see a car my neck is always hurting and um jet lag jet lag is an absolute killer it ruins me um diet like i'm fat <laughs> so I've, I've grown up this like barbell healthy lifestyle like we discussed you can't maintain a healthy lifestyle when you're traveling it's impossible like it just is mm-hmm. i drink a lot whilst i'm traveling as well just like i don't know just you just end up drinking like you've had a long day you just have a beer you have two beer three beers so who knows maybe in a couple of years i'll pack it in yeah because you can only do this sort of traveling you know for a number of years and i've been doing it hardcore like for like eight years now mm. um <clears throat> so it's pretty extreme but it's you know you do miss it you come home like i've now gone back into a six-week diet where i'll have a you know go gym all the time and have a healthy lifestyle but four weeks on i'll be bored again i'll be like right what's the next adventure so you get itchy feet as you say yeah because i was going to ask as well obviously you're local to us you're in plymouth um born and bred in plymouth i think born and bred mate yeah yeah as the accent would suggest yeah um and obviously going to all these different amazing places like i i don't travel like you do i've been on lots of holidays and stuff but i've got you know growing like aspirations to maybe immigrate or emigrate somewhere else um and i, I wonder for somebody who's so traveled who's in a position now that they're complete like a, a complete digital nomad like why do you keep coming back to plymouth is it just familiar and, and family yeah that's the main reasons home is home end of the day as much as i some sometimes hate living here because the weather's terrible in it yeah. every day it's just so it's shit. miserable <laughs> isn't it? it's miserable even summer now is summer, not, it's raining. summer's not summer it's anymore, not we is it? don't get a summer it's just it's, shit. it's like the news as well like brushes over it as if it's like oh it's fine <laughs> and the crime rate here is a joke you see the news and you say why am i living here it's expensive like you just think, like, what am I doing? But home's home at the end of the day. And your mates, you come close with my mates and family. I do love British culture. People think we don't have a culture. We do. There's nothing like British culture. And um, um, But will I live here in a few years? Maybe. Maybe not. Mm. But there's only one place I'd consider living. That would be East Europe. Um, just I like East Europe. It's safe. I like I like those countries. They actually get four seasons and it's a lot cheaper. There's loads of aspects why I love East Europe, but I would never live anywhere other than Europe. Yeah. Mm. Nowhere too far away from home. 
I've got people, I've got friends that live in Australia. It's like, it's the other end of the world, like 12 hour time difference, whatever it is. How do you even speak to your family? You don't. So home's home. I'll probably be living here for the rest of my life. Yeah. yeah. Where in Eastern Europe do you particularly like? Oh, I love Poland, Estonia, Latvia, these countries. Um, I've just come back from Montenegro, Croatia, you know, that's a bit south, but like these countries are awesome and love them. They're great. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting point you just made about the travel thing because I can remember, you might remember last year I, with my job, I traveled around the UK a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think there was one particular week where I, I think I had to go up to Manchester um, and then back. And then I think we went up to Manchester for a podcast and back. And then I had to go in the, 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 the second week back to Manchester, <laughs> across the whole, and then back. And I think I worked out that I was traveling like over the course of a week, like 40 hours. Mm -hmm. And even just stuff like my heart rate variability, like it just went through the floor. I felt fucking dreadful. The only thing I feel. Well, this <laughs> is it. Yeah. And people obviously, because we even talked about it off, you know, offline where Danny was like, I'm really jealous of your life because you get to all these different places. But... I think it's such a good point that people probably don't appreciate is the, is the toll on your kind of body and, you know, the amount of effort it actually takes to travel and Mate, it is all glamorous. Ruins, ruins us. Like mm. a lot of people see, oh, I wish I could travel and stuff. I get it. It is awesome. Don't get me wrong. I love, love traveling. A lot of countries I don't like, but 90% I love, but it is a killer. Like, especially the way we do it. Um, there's so many countries where I've been there, I've made like five videos and people only see that 15 minute, 20 minute scene or whatever. I'm there for three weeks. Like, for example, Mongolia, like the land of nothing. We drove, me and Bold, something like, pff, we were there for like two weeks. We spent five days of that in a car driving through nothing. And he got one video, like half an hour long. I got four 15 minute videos. People don't see the journeys and like what it is to get there. It is a killer. Even like you said, drive around the UK or trains, wears you out. Like people like, they don't understand um, how exhausting it really is mentally, physically, it takes its toll on you. So yeah, you, you, you've, seen, you've seen what it's like to travel in the UK. Mm. Try renting a car in bloody, I don't know, where have I rented a car? Every, everywhere and just yeah. driving for weeks like ruins you yeah yeah and then i guess you add then obviously the contact creation on top of that yeah because you're not even just going around just enjoying the sites you're obviously thinking about the videos yep. and getting your shots and everything else so yeah i mean it's probably not as glamorous as people think by no, a mile. so a lot of people think youtube oh you go out make a video it takes 20 minutes doesn't it's a lot of thought goes into a video and a lot of people only see the 20 minute final video. There's over a two hours of content that you obviously edit down. And I don't, I don't have an editor. Like a lot of people have like editors and stuff. I do everything. So for example, my recent trip in Uganda, we'll wake up 7 a.m. sharp. Um, we'll be filming from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. We go back, That we got two hours of content. That'll only be, that'll make eight minutes into the video like people don't see like the whole journey of that day right and then it doesn't stop you go home you sit down on your laptop and you edit until 11 p.m and then you wake up you do it all over again so you do that solid for like a month and i'll literally burn myself into the ground come home to england and then i edit those videos mm. and that's it that's what i do so yeah, yeah you it's no longer like a holiday and traveling. I've just come back from a holiday and loved it. So Montenegro, Croatia was a holiday. When I go to certain countries now, it's, it's work at the end of the day, isn't it? So mm. you go in there to make videos and yeah. Do you kind of miss like going on these adventures like you did in the very beginning, like the first time you went to yeah. India where you were just there, you kind of filmed the bit just for a, for a laugh. Mm -hmm. Do you kind of almost like in some way like miss that and regret that it's now a job, as you say? Yeah, it's a huge part of me. It's like it takes away the fun of traveling a little bit. Uh, obviously, I'm not faulting um, complaining about doing this for a living. It's, it's awesome. But like, yeah, of course it does. Because also when you're not filming and you're in a certain country where you know the content's good, if you straight away you think, fuck's sake, this is good content. Like I should be filming this. And it shouldn't be that way. You should be there just enjoying the moment for what it is. And 
But of course, I go to, I go on holidays. Like I've just been those places in Europe, and I'm going to go places at the end of December on holiday. So I won't bring my camera. And I've been to loads of countries where I don't film. And I'll be with people like, oh, you should be filming this, you should be filming this, this is good content. I'm like, it is good content, but nah, I'm not filming. Like, no way. I just want to chill. Yeah, what point do you think that you'll be able to get an editor and, or do you enjoy doing that? I don't. Sort of I've, got, I've had editors, like, I've given them, I've give, I've given a chance and they just don't do it the way, they miss it. You sound like someone they miss else certain on things. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like someone else on that one. You know what I mean? Like, you, you'll give them a task or something and they'll send it back to you and I'm like the fuck's this and you've got to change you spend more time correcting their work than you may like I say if you want a job done right you do it yourself so I spent three years or whatever it was editing everything a lot of people don't realise as well like you just fall into like YouTube you, we work our bollocks off like they don't see 99% it's like that iceberg thing isn't it that, that photo yeah. they see that tip they don't see the cr massive mountain below that you've worked your ass off for. Yeah. A lot of YouTubers as well, they want that shortcut. And I've met many in my, in, in my time. They just want that shortcut. Like they want that instant success. They, it's like, no, you've got to work for it. It's right. like us, and it? That's all we do. It's the amount of hours we put in yeah, compared to yeah. what we're getting out of it. It's, yeah. it's not the same. But yeah. you hope over time it switches the other way. Yeah, I did four years or whatever, um, three years or something of countless videos. And... Yeah, it, it takes time. And how does the uh, perception change from the people around you? Like, so you are making videos and they're getting no views. Were you ever, like, getting taken the piss out of? Were you ever getting sly remarks or anything like that? Or were people supportive? I'll be honest, it's, it can be a bit... Um, when you first start, it's cringe, isn't it? Like, you put yeah. yourself on camera and people are like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, we, we oh, YouTube, definitely like... <laughs> <It's> <laughs> We've like, been there. Yeah. Like, what a loser. And you're like, oh, it's embarrassing. Especially if you just start YouTube. Mm -hmm. And people are like, oh, what's your channel? And you're embarrassed to say, aren't you? And I'm like, oh, backpacker Ben. They'll look at you like, can't even see it, mate. Where is it? <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, that's the one, four subscribers. So they're like, all right, okay. Uh, I'll never forget, actually, I met a Japanese... No, they weren't Japanese. They were in Japan. I was doing videos there like four years ago and I'm filming. They're like, what are you doing? I'm like, YouTube videos. And it's, it's so embarrassing. And I'm like, yeah, I'd like 10 subscribers. And they're like, oh, good luck with that. And they messaged me a couple of months ago. like, fucking hell, mate. You're like, what the fucking hell? Like, I'm sorry for <laughs> laughing at you. I'm like, you know, but it's all about not caring what people think. You, know, you, only, you only live once. Who cares? Mm. Do it. Yeah. Like there's so many people that I've met they have the personality to really make it work. I'm like, you could do it, mate. You could do it. You're funny as hell. And like, they just don't, they just... It's putting yourself out there, mate, isn't it? Putting yourself out there. For criticism, for all those types of things. 100%. And I think the biggest barrier for me personally, when we even started this, was just the people, I don't care what people think that don't know me. It honestly doesn't bother no, me. No, it's all. more of a It's more the people that know me and are close to me. I don't want them thinking I'm an idiot or a prick or, yep. you know, and that, and that was the biggest thing for me. The biggest reservation was pretty much my close mates and yep. just thinking, why is he trying this? Why, no. What a knob, you know? Mate, some of my best mates still to this day don't even ask me about it. They don't even say, oh, um, like, is that your job? They just yeah. think I'm traveling around making videos and stuff. They yeah. still to this day ask me oh when are you gonna get a normal job i'm like <laughs> i'll just say oh maybe next year mate yeah, yeah. but they don't understand like i don't i don't think a lot of my my, my friends watch listen to the podcast mm. but we've got f listeners <laughs> yeah, exactly, thousands yeah. of listeners all over the world yeah. you know but they don't they don't kind of realize i don't know if it's the same for you but you know i'll speak to them they'll go oh, how's it going and i'm like yeah all right so yeah, you're yeah. not listening then they're like no nah, no nah. <laughs> well I, I, that's why i don't do podcasts because i hate talking about myself mm. i hate it so i just hate saying i this i that i don't like doing it so um, when I see my friends and I've just done these sort of adventures I've told you about, they never bring it up. I don't know why they just don't bring it up. They don't say, oh, how was the Taliban and stuff like that. They don't. And I will never bring it up myself. So with this girl there, I haven't seen him in like three or four months and we'll sit there and there's be like, watch football? I'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll see some bear and I'm like, oh, look at her over there. Like, you don't talk about like, yeah. you just don't. It's weird. I don't know why. Even my family, we don't talk about it. It's, it is strange. Yeah, that is strange. I think a lot of people just, they, I just don't think they get it. Like you say, I think they certainly don't understand the graph. 100%. That's the main one. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we've obviously got day jobs and this is by no means like, you know, our living yet, but hopefully one day, who knows? Yeah. 
But just like you say with the editing, he was laughing because I'm exactly the same. Like I, I always say, oh, I'd love to have an editor because it takes me like probably fucking 10 hours a week to edit an episode. Yeah. But equally, I'm like, I, probably, I don't think I could give it up. No. Nope. And I did a podcast for my employer as like the host. Mm -hmm. And they did all the editing and I watched it back and I was like, oh, they should have cut that bit out. And yeah. I was, uh, the loads of yeah, bits, I, I was so annoyed. Like, <laughs> they missed those little bits yeah. that changes everything. Yeah, yeah. And you just like, oh, bollocks to this. Yeah, I've had like 10, 15 different ones and you just give up with them because it's like, oh, can't do this anymore. It's even like little bits for us. It's like they go, people, we get really good guests on and they're like, how'd you get these guests on? Like, how'd you do it? And I'm like, well, once you start getting good guests on, it kind of steamrolls a little bit. But yeah. also it's the fucking hours that you spend emailing messaging speaking to commenting liking yeah. you know speaking to someone who knows someone to put us in touch with them and you know just that alone yeah. takes five ten hours a week just of just <laughs> scrolling and people messaging know, and just they? finding new guests and people yeah. that are exciting and 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 it's not just some people we've got to follow and it's like you look at them sometimes and is their english good or is are, do they come across well do they talk well you know there's a lot of different aspects where sometimes we've looked at a guest and oh, they'd be good to get on we've actually talked to them or watch their content and be like it'd be an hard conversation yeah so we just can't do it yeah so it is a graph mate and i think people yeah just don't get it but we'll keep doing what we do yeah so what's next for you mate where are you off to next what's on the list <laughs> believe it or not i'm going back to india <laughs> okay <nice. laughs> not my idea it's bold's idea okay oh, so um we've done been doing this thing recently where because we like traveling together right we have a laugh and we motivate each other to film that's the thing as well like i'm at the point where I, I i need motivation to film and he's the same he would have quit youtube a year ago if it really? wasn't for me 100 percent. and he won't care if i say this i think he said he announced anyway like oh, i'm done with youtube when i hit 50 he's at 50 still going um but he's like uh he needs the motivation to film i need the motivation to film so we have a laugh we have a good crack and um, yeah, so I just chose Uganda. Before that, he chose Scotland. Scotland was, was great laugh, but it was nothing to film. We went to the Shetland Islands. You know these places? Yeah, the Shetland Islands. No content there. I took him to Uganda. Best content in the world for him. So um, he's now chose India. And I'm like, oh God, here we go. <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to get sick. I was about to say, ready for the shit. I'm gonna get sick, man. <laughs> I just always get sick. Everyone who, who's gone there, even if they go go or whatever, they always say straight away, for a couple of days, boom, bad stuff. Mate, yeah, you, you, I, I'm gonna stay in a nice hotel this time just to avoid it, and I'll still get sick <laughs> or a cough from the pollution. So, yeah, there you go. We're going there in a three weeks. Well, I look forward to uh, watching that content, then, mate. Thank you. But mate, thank you for coming on. It's been really interesting. As I say, I genuinely really enjoy your content. So it was, uh, yeah, it was really cool to, to chat to you. Yeah, that was wow. good fun, guys. And uh, yeah, keep filming it, mate. But appreciate you coming on, mate. Safe travels. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, mate. Thank you very much. Cheers.